morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you to City of Casper for inviting us to participate in their stormwater workshop. Um, before I get started, because if I don't say it right away, I'm going to forget. For those of you who use our website regularly, um, if you haven't been on the website lately, the old one is gone. We have a new one at a different address. It's deq.wyoming.gov now. And I'll pull it up later. Okay, she'll, Andrea will pull it up. Um, it's completely rearranged. It's all new and improved. <laughs> and if you can't find anything, call us. All right, this is a very high altitude uh, picture of construction stormwater from not only how we regulate construction sites, but how we regulate the city of Casper regulating construction sites. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to focus today on subdivisions, but this applies to all construction. I'm focusing on subdivisions because that's really one of our worst pollutant sources right now, uh, particularly because they often tend to be large. They tend to be in urban areas with storm drains that pipe pollutants, especially sediment, directly to nearby <coughs> surface waters. And you've got several surface waters here in Casper. So I will focus on subdivisions, but this applies just the same to every construction project, whether it's oil and gas or roads or anything else. All right, so what is it all about? The whole point of the stormwater program is, well, it's part of the Clean Water Act, which is a federal act, and it's to protect surface waters. Now, throughout the country, we mostly protect waters of the U.S. In Wyoming, we protect waters of the state because we have, in addition to the Clean Water Act, at the federal level, we have the State Environmental Quality Act, which actually gives us a lot larger universe of waters that we protect. If it's a dry draw, um, a, a big one, small one, even if it hardly ever has water in it, if it could have water in it, it's probably a surface water of the state. Stock ponds, irrigation ditches, as well as off and off that. Actual creeks and rivers and lakes are all surface waters of the state. All right, again, the stormwater permits are all part of the Federal Clean Water Act. In the state of Wyoming, and as in most states, the state has primacy to run the program within the state borders. The only place in Wyoming where DEQ does not have what we call primacy to run the program is on tribal lands. So if you also do construction projects on the Wind River Indian Reservation, you will get your permit from EPA rather than us. <coughs> Alright, we have construction general permits. All of this is managed through permits. What the, we have two construction general permits. One is a small construction permit that covers one acre to five acres. The other is five acres and up. That's the large construction general permit. Um, both permits are actually identical except that the small construction general permit is a no application permit. It has the exact same requirements as the large construction permit, but you follow the permit on your own without applying to DEQ. <laughs> As long as you are in compliance with the permit, you're covered by it. Both permits require what's called a Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, or a SWIP for short, or a lot of highway engineers will call it a P3 or a PQ. There are very specific requirements for the SWIP. The SWIP is your plan for your construction site of what exact BMPs you will put in and where you'll put them in to keep pollutants on your construction site and not running off the construction site and then on into surface water somewhere. This can be sediment, which is the most common construction per, uh, pollutant, but fuels, concrete washout, any pollutant that could be mobilized by stormwater runoff and go off the construction site needs to be covered in the slip. If you have a pile of bricks, it's not going to run off in rain, so you don't have to worry about putting that into your slip. If you have a dirt stockpile, a fueling area, a concrete washout area, all of those areas need to be addressed in the sweat. 
And again, the permit itself, which is online, it's a general permit that covers all construction projects, will tell you exactly how you need to address each one of these items. It is important to note that your SWIP is an enforceable part of your permit. So if you say you're going to do 50 different BMPs out here and I show up and you have one, that's a problem. Uh, or if you say they're all going to be over there, but they're actually all over there, that's also a problem. So your SWIP needs to be up to date with what's on the ground. Did I catch everything in there? I did. All right. Briefly, who needs coverage? Well, any operator, now, what we call an operator is anyone who has day-to-day -day control and supervision of the activities at the construction site. You're the company or person who can tell anybody on that construction site that you need to fix that straw bale, clean out that detention pond. If you have that authority, you are the operator. So you need to be the permittee. The permittee can change throughout the life of the project. A lot of times, especially on a subdivision, you'll get the, the guy that comes out and does the overall lot grading, installs the utilities, maybe installs the roads. Then he starts parceling out the work to other operators or selling lots to individual builders. At that point, the permit needs to get transferred to whoever has control at that time. So, if you disturb an acre or more on any construction project, or you're working on a smaller piece of a construction project, maybe you bought a single lot, but the overall construction plan has a disturbance of an acre or more, everybody needs a construct, uh, construction permit. They need their own permit. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Can the folks in the back hear me okay? Awesome. All right. So the, the bit with the smaller than an acre disturbances is the common plan of development or sale. So whether it's an industrial subdivision, an oil and gas uh, drilling project, or you have many small well pads, but they all add up to a lot more than an acre, they all need to have permit coverage. The size of the entire project determines which permit you got. So the large construction permit, that's five acres and up of disturbance, but if you have a, a 10 acre subdivision and you buy a one acre lot, you also need a large construction stormwater permit because that is part of that larger common plan that disturbs five or more acres. The small construction permit is one to five acres of disturbance. You buy a quarter acre lot somewhere in the corner but the whole plan is four acres, you need a small construction stormwater permit for your bit of disturbance. So I have an example. I have a six acre subdivision. All of the lots are half an acre. And then there's a really big road. And to make it six acres, I had to make the road an acre. So developer Dan has come out. He's going to put this subdivision together. He's going to do the overlock grading, he's going to strip everything, kind of level it out, put the road in, put the utilities to all the lots. But he's not going to build the homes. So the first home is sold to Builder Bob. Now that's a half acre lot. So Dan had a large construction general permit. Now he has sold a half acre to Builder Bob. Does Builder Bob need a permit? Yes, what kind? Large. Yay! <laughs> I, sh I, should I should have brought like M&Ms or something. <laughs> All right, then Carpenter Carl buys four more lots. He's got two acres. So that's between one and five acres. So does Carpenter Carl need a small construction or a large construction? Large. Yes, you guys are awake. That's <laughs> awesome. All right, investor Irene has bought the last of the lots. And she is not going to build anything on these lots, but she, they're undisturbed when she buys them. She's planning to just hold on to these lots for three years. She's going to flip them for a huge profit and retire to Jamaica. So 
Even though she's not building a home, does she need a permit? <coughs> she is not disturbing, but she bought disturbed land. So she needs that large construction permit as well. Now a way for her to get out of it as quickly as possible is to get out there and seed that ground. And as soon as that vegetation is up, then she can get out of the permit. So if you take on a disturbed piece of ground, you also need to have a permit on it until it is vegetated. I have a question there. So then, let's say the, uh, the gentleman who initially had the large construction permit, the one that's great and all that, um, he's done his job, he's done his work, he sold everything off, everybody's got their own individual permit. This is terminated then, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. What her question is, now developer Dan has sold off all of the lots, and the road is paved, there's nothing left that he controls, does he still need a permit? No, he no longer needs the permit. Has he sold the lot to Bob, Bob would send us a new notice of intent for his, or an application for his half an acre. We'd issue him coverage, and Bob would take that half an acre out of his stormwater pollution prevention plan, because there's a map that goes with the stormwater plan that shows the area that you're disturbing. So Bob would, or Dan would go in and cross that off. The same when Carl bought his two acres, Carl should send us a notice of intent. We would issue him new coverage for those two acres. And Dan just crosses those two acres out of his plan. When he sells the last piece to Irene, that's it. Dan then sends us a notice of termination saying, I've sold everything. Or better yet, he, sent, he does a transfer, which we'll talk about later in the morning, to Irene that transfer his remaining permit to Irene. They can work either way. So whoever, whoever controls bare ground out on this construction site needs to have a permit. Once they're, they've sold everything, got rid of it one way or the other, stabilized it, they can either terminate the permit or transfer it. Uh, Barbara, I have a question. Yeah. Is Dan going to need to submit anything along with the notice of transfer or termination, any documentation specifically? Okay, the question is, does Dan need to submit any documentation when he gets rid of that last bit to Irene? Yeah. He does not need to submit any documentation other than either the notice of termination where he certifies, I certify under penalty of law, <coughs> that I no longer own anything here, it's all being taken over by Irene, or the same thing when he transfers it, that I am transferring everything I have left to Irene, and that's the documentation we need. So. The brief history is Dan gets the permit to begin with. He gets a large construction permit. Bob gets a large construction permit because he has, he's part of that common plan. Dan removes that from his, his slip. Carl does the same thing. Dan removes that bit. And the same with uh, Irene, except for Dan will transfer what's left to Irene. Okay, my question. Uh are these all going to be the same permit number? The question is, will these all be the same permit number? No, they will not, because Bob only has control of his half acre, and Dan only has, <coughs> or Carl only has control of his. So they're separate permits. So that if Bob has a problem but Carl doesn't, then we can go talk to Bob. I'm getting confused on all these names. <laughs> So yeah, as the only time that that permit number, the original permit number, goes to the new person is when it's actually transferred to someone. Now the, another point is, Carl bought four lots. He does not need four permits. He can lump those four permits into one. Irene can lump her five lots into one permit. We don't even want one on lot by lot by lot. And you especially don't want to do that because with a large construction permit, there is a permit fee. So there's no real point to doing that. 
Now there are, as Dan is getting rid of his lots, each new permittee has to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan for their disturbance. There's two options. Either Bob and Carl and Irene can write a whole new SWIFT for their bits of the construction project that just addresses their area. <coughs> or they can continue to use Dan's SWIFT if it's relevant to their new construction. They may have to update it. They'll have to certainly update it for personnel. Um, of course, there'll be new construction. Dan was only worried about the, the grading and the putting in of roads and utilities. Now we're building homes. We've got new stockpiles. We've got new concrete washout areas that weren't there. So if Dan had, say, a sediment detention pond on one end of the, the subdivision, all three of these owners could now use that sediment detention pond under some kind of agreement with each other as who's going to maintain it, how is it going to be handled. Or they can decide to do their own, totally own thing, do on lot best management practices. They can just ignore everybody else and, and keep their sediment on their little lot. That gets really problematic with subdivisions, especially with the types of lots they're selling today. They're like teeny tiny. Um, they're just so it's really hard to put an effective sediment control on a quarter acre lot or a fifth acre lot. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So those are things you kind of have to consider as you're buying lots. How am I going to address the erosion control? Do I need to work with these other builders to have a, an erosion control down here and maybe a group concrete washout so that we spend a lot less money and not reinvent the wheel lot by lot by lot? So sometimes taking advantage of the global BMPs really works well. It's been my experience so far that if you have 10 builders in a neighborhood, they don't talk to each other a whole lot. And that hasn't worked well in practice. I'm hoping over time, with the help of Casper and, and Cheyenne and some of the other cities that have municipal stormwater permits, uh, we can maybe get people to think more about using these more neighborhood-wide best management practices rather than trying to do this on a lot by lot basis. So a few points about stormwater pollution prevention plans. Again, we don't have a lot of time today, but they must be effective at controlling pollution in a two year, 24 hour storm or smaller. And a lot of the state, I think Casper included, certainly Cheyenne, the two year 24 hour storm is about an inch and a half. So if you get an inch and a half of rain, you should be losing very few pollutants, if, if not any pollutants, off your site. Now if you get a four inch rain and it all hell breaks loose and you lose a bunch of stuff, but you had reasonable BMPs up for that, that two year 24 hour storm, there is no permit violation. We just simply say, go clean it up, put your BMPs back, and keep going. You're OK. If you get a four inch rainstorm and you had no BMPs up, or your BMPs were not well maintained, or they were inadequate for a two year, 24 hour storm, that is a permit violation. So you should be knowing about what kind of rain you're going to deal with, how much water you're going to get, how how your BMPs are going to work with that much water. And if you can show that you had good BMPs when that big storm comes by, you're OK. How far away from the site do they have to clean up if a <coughs> big event occurs? If, it depends on the site. If you, if we can, if you filled up the street for three blocks down, and we can set, show that it mostly came from your site, we're going to ask you to clean it all up. Now, if it does go off into a pasture, and it's not like super deep, and the landowner of that pasture says, ah, oh, just leave it, don't worry about it. We're not going to worry about cleaning it up, because if you disturb that badge, um, you'll actually create a bigger problem. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. But in urban areas, because a lot of these 
runoff events dump into storm drains and into streets, generally we require certainly the streets, <coughs> curbs, and gutters to be cleaned up. Occasionally you have neighbors whose yards are buried and they're not going to say we're okay with you leaving it. We'll ask you to clean that up as well. We do have deadlines within the permit for cleanup. One of the things you have to do with this SWIP is you have whatever best management practices or BMPs that you put in. Maybe it's a detention pond or straw bales or, or straw bottles. If you have to inspect those on a regular basis, defined in the permit, anything from a week to two weeks to monthly, depending on what's going on on the work site, if you note in an inspection that the detention pond is half full or the silt fence is down, you have, I think in the permit, and if it's active construction, you're actually out there, I think you have 24 hours to fix it. Yeah. yeah. And I think if it's inactive construction, I think it's two weeks to get somebody out there to clean out that pond, reinstall the silt fence, And that should, of course, because we're government, that should all be documented. All right, so we talked already a little bit about the two-year, 24-hour storm. Inspections. <coughs> if you're actively constructing, you have people out there moving dirt, or building homes, or people out there on a daily basis. There are two schedules you can inspect on. You can either inspect every seven days, regardless of whether we get a rain event in between, or you can inspect every 14 days and after a one half inch <coughs> precipitation event, whether it's snow <coughs> or rain, within 24 hours of that event. So if you inspect it on Tuesday, but you've got three quarters of an inch of rain on Thursday, you need to inspect your BMPs again by Friday. That's if you do was that if you did the 14 That's day? That's if you yeah. do the 14 day. But if you go a weekly? If, if you go the weekly, then there's no precipitation trigger. If you're done constructing and you haven't transferred the permit yet for whatever reason, or you own the property, so you're not going to transfer the permit, you're going to keep it until that site is revegetated. There's no construction going on, then inspections go to every 30 days. And there is no rain event trigger. So if you inspect on the first of the month, you know, you'll just do it the first of the month for however long. We do have a snow cover and frozen ground exception. Works really well in places like Jackson and Pinedale. Uh, doesn't work so well here on the front range because we will get really frozen ground for a month, but usually it warms up the snow starts to melt, the ground's getting soft. I know my yard's been a frozen brick for about a month, but I was walking on it the other day and it's starting to soften up and thaw. All right. This looks like not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, Jason Kelm, City Casper. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other questions for Barb. Um, the city pretty much is responsible for anything that the state DEQ requires. Um, the reason is because we are bound under the MS4 permit. There's there's uh, two cities, I believe. Three yeah, cities. Casper area and Cheyenne area. There's two cities within the state of Wyoming that actually are large enough that are, are bound by the MS4 permit by DEQ. Not that the other cities are, are exempt from any uh, any permitting processes or any BMPs, but uh, um, we actually have to work very closely with them. Um, and our MS4 permit is up this year. We're getting a new one. When year. I get the new permit written, it's <laughs> expired for two years. So <laughs> our, 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 we're still working on the, under the old MS4 mm -hmm. permit, um, which we will still operate under um, until the new one comes out. And with this new one, I imagine there's going to be tighter restrictions and regulations on it um, for the city of Casper. EPA um, is certainly pushing that for EPA sure. EPA is definitely making uh, DQ up this permit and require more um, uh, regulations in it. Um, right now, we're still working on the old one, so we're, that's why we're trying to do this workshop now, because uh, we anticipate that 
our new M Sport permit is going to come through, and we're going to be required to do a lot more documentation and um, supply DEQ with a lot more of our permits and our inspection stuffs to them. So that's kind of why we wanted to get you guys here in front of us, so that uh, it's not going to be a surprise when it happens. Uh, like I said, the city of Casper, uh, we basically follow a lot of uh, DEQ's regulations, especially in the SWIP and the, and the five acre and greater requirements. Um, once you hit that five acre or greater, you're required to have a SWIP with us and with DEQ. So we don't have a specific SWIP template or anything like that that we provide you guys. Basically, once you hit that trigger of the five acre and you're required to submit it to DEQ, that submittal has to come to the city of Casper also and has to basically meet their requirements as far as how that template gets filled out, how your SWIP gets filled out. Um, the BMP is in place. Um, your, uh, maintenance stuff, requirements, and all of your inspection requirements, that all has to be submitted to us, basically concurrence with DEQ. Um, so not only do you have to get a notice of, uh, uh, or a authorization, I believe that's what you guys call it, from DEQ, you're still not allowed to go break ground until you get the permit from the city of Casper. So that is one of the requirements on that. Uh, with the city of Casper, we do require a permit for a one acre disturbance between one and five acre. Um, DEQ doesn't actually submit a permit, I believe, for that size, but we do submit a permit for that size. So if you are disturbing one acre, or between one and five acres, we do require you to have a permit through the city of Casper, so you're still not able to break ground, even though DEQ doesn't require that. You're not able to go out and make disturbance until that permit from the city of Casper is uh, been issued to you. And I... Jason, do you require them to submit because they have to have a SWIP for that one acre to five acre disturbance, do you require to, them to submit that SWIP to you guys? So our, our SWIP, yeah, our SWIP doesn't really take trigger until that five acre is okay. in place. It's, the five acre is basically the same trigger for you as the same trigger for us, but if it's just one to five acres, you have to just submit an applicant communication to us showing you us where the location is, uh, how much you're going to disturb, and what your plan is as far as the UPs. I mean, it, that's just in our application form. Um, the permit itself looks something like this. So once it's issued to you guys, this is what it looks like. It's printed off on yellow card stock paper, and it's required to be visible when we come up on your site. So it's supposed to be hung on the side of a trailer or in the back of a window of a truck or whoever your supervisor is. This is supposed to be visible so that uh, if I drive by and we don't see uh, anything like this hanging around any of your project sites, we, we will probably get out and ask you, hey, where's your permit? Did you get it submitted with the city caster? Stuff like that. So it is required to have that visible on one acre and plus. Um, all this, our permit requirements are outlined um, pretty thoroughly in the municipal code of the city of Casper, and I have a link up there for our code requirements. Um, and we will probably provide this PowerPoint also to everybody, just so you don't have to write all these crazy number links down. Um, if you have that email to Beth, we'll probably give you a link of where all these PowerPoints are going to be provided on, on the webpage or on the city's webpage. We haven't figured that out, but we will figure something out. <laughs> um, erosion control and summit permit. There's the link for the permit that's required by the city of Casper. It's about four pages long. It is in your packet. There's uh, not only is it required just for you to talk about your BMPs on there, but we require um, certain fees for as far as inspection fees. And then um, along with that, we require uh, sureties for, for your site that you're uh, disturbing. So if you want to take a look at that, out and take a look at it because I didn't put it up on a slide. Um, as far as your uh, your SWIFT permits and your permits that get submitted to us, it is required that uh, you actually have a professional engineer have it submitted with a stamp on it. So you can't just have your brother fill out your SWIFT permit and hand it in to the city of Casper. It actually has to be uh, has to be put together by a licensed engineer. 
Um, it, the permit has to be, you know, show all the sufficient things that Barb talked about. We'll actually go into it a lot more in detail with the next presentation as far as what's going to be in your SWIP permit. Um, when Andrew gets up, we'll go through a lot more detail of what's going to be in your permit, your SWIP permit, and stuff like that. Um, if you look, you're, you're uh, on that permit there. <coughs> it talks about your surety, which is. Um, So this just talks about the five acres disturbance, um, the, the permit itself. We actually have a pretty good um, handbook that we put, we put together back in 2004. It looks something like this. It's a pretty in-depth book on what are BMPs, how do you install BMPs, how do you maintain BMPs, what type of uh, um, other measures you can do besides just straw waddles, besides just bales, silk fences. Um, this is provided if you come into our office, we have packets like this. Or here's another crazy link you can go to. It's on our webpage. This whole thing is on our webpage for you guys to access. Uh, it's a great guidance for you guys to use when you're putting together your SWIFT plans. To have out on site if you guys have a new supervisor that's just not quite sure, it's good guidance to have around. All right, the permit is required to post with the city a performance bond, cash, cash is always good, right? Letter of credit or any other approved surety in the amount of 10 cents per square foot for the first 1 million square feet of disturbance. So that's required for any disturbance, basically an acre or greater, to the city of Casper. Uh, if you do the math, I think a million a square feet is almost 23 acres. It's like 22 and some change. Um, a one acre lot would be $4,500. I think our minimum requirement is a $5,000 check or bond. So if you just serve one acre, you would have, you'd be required to submit one of those approved sureties for a minimum of $5,000. permit that exceeds a million square feet. So if you have a, and we have a lot of these subdivisions going up right now, it's more than 23 acres. If, you're, if your subdivision is gonna be greater than 23 acres, then you can submit a surety or some sort of line of credit that equals to two and a half times what it costs to either reseed the entire area and place all the MVPs needed to get that thing vegetated. And you need to show that to me by a basically a, a quote from you know a seeding company that would take the seed 100 acres if you have 100 acres we need to see exactly what that quote would be for that company to come in and seed 100 acres plus on top of that it would be all the costs that would be to install any silk fences any bmps any of that stuff and the reason that is required is if you guys are going to be doing a subdivision and the price of oil drops and you decide to go to arizona we will take your surety and we will reseed and we will do whatever it takes to get that plot of land back to vegetative state. So that is why we require to have some sort of a bond or a surety with us. Um, basically, if you don't take care of it, we will. So those are your two options. Once you get to a certain size, um, the two and a half times the full amount cost gets to be kind of high. Um, our maximum amount of surety that that's required, we have a cap on that, is basically $100,000. So once it gets to a certain size, you're basically just giving me a surety for $100,000. Again, uh, we need to have proof of that two and a half times the full count cost, and it has to be provided by a professional engineer, and that has to be submitted to us. Not that I don't believe you guys. <laughs> Um, uh, the fee has to include the total, in total cost of the erosion settlement control issues, um, including any maintenance. And that's all outlined in this, all of this is outlined in your city, in the city ordinance. 
In the event that uh, you shall the posting of the mountain permit area exceeds one million, we went over that. Um, okay, I went over that whole slide. No permittee shall be issued unless the, or until the permittee has filed a certificate of insurance. So also, not only do you have to submit a, a surety with us, whoever's doing the work out there has to have a certificate of insurance and it has to be on file in the city engineer's office for the entire project. If your project, if your insurance is a one year insurance plan and your project takes two years to build, you need to update that insurance policy with us for, every, for the entire length of the construction that's going on. Um, along with that insurance policy, you have to name the city of Casper as an additional insured. Um, that's basically just covering us in case you decide not to do anything and you destroy the neighborhood next door. That neighborhood doesn't can't come back to us. We're going to cover under that insurance. Or if you destroy property, or if somebody gets hurt, or any of that, that's why we require that insurance policy to be to be covered in the city of Casper. Also, and it has to be filed with us. If I don't have those two things in my hand, you don't get a permit. So you have to make sure those those things are all issued to me, and it's all approved. And we will issue them that permit to you. Uh, the insurance shall contain a provision that the insurance coverage will not be canceled, uh, no material changed, um, no, no, re no renewal will be refused. And if any of that does, you have to give us no 30 days notice before any of that happens. If you're changing insurance companies, you have to give me notice. And once that you get a new certificate, then it has to be put into my office. If you anything on your insurance coverage is changed, anything as far as limits or liabilities has changed, you have to give me notice that that all is going to be changed. It has to be in my hand. If we come on site and uh, you have a different insurance policy, that's a violation of your permit. So uh, it's, it's not our responsibility to go around and call your insurance companies to see if anything's changed. It's your responsibility to let us know. Um, when we come on site and inspect, that's something we'll probably look at. Uh, you come in and you provide you uh, you're disturbing a huge acre and you needed a swim plan by us and by DEQ. Um, I'm not sure what DEQ's rules are, but if you give a, get a permit by us, and for some reason the developer just doesn't have any money to do anything, and they decide not to do any work, and it takes them a year to even get out there and do any work, if you haven't even done any work in a year, that permit is basically void, and you have to start all over with us. Um, so if you're not planning on doing any work, there's really no point to give me a swift until you're getting closer to the, to the job. So I don't really want to go through the process twice, to tell you the truth. But if that does happen, <laughs> if that does happen, then uh, you have to uh, notify me. If you get a permit and uh, you've got this big area to disturb, and nothing's happening, the developer doesn't want to start work, and this doesn't want to start work. You need to notify me, and we can either put a uh, stop on it and let, let it sit, or we can renew it again for another year. But you have to notify me. If you don't notify me and that thing sits for a year and you've done no work, it's void. And then all of a sudden you're out on site breaking ground, and I notice it's been past a year, and then you're, you're basically in a violation of a permit. So you need to submit a brand new permit. Um, if that permit happens, if that happens, if you basically go that year and no work happens and that permit goes void, again, notify me if, if that basically no construction can, and you think, oh, no construction can happen for the next three years, you just notify me and we will, we will return your surety back to the bank or cash or whatever you handed me. But uh, it's kind of, again, your responsibility to let me know that. Otherwise, it could sit there. And if I don't know, then it could sit there as long as it does. How long does it typically take for the city to turn around and You know, this week I've been pretty busy. <laughs> so this week was a little slow. Mm -hmm. But we do pretty well about turning around our permits. If you have everything in place, uh, I think it typically we do about 15 days. Okay. It's two weeks. Um, most of our permit processes go a lot quicker than a DEQ process, but 
Um, like I said, this week I was busy, so it might have been a little slower. Uh, again, if uh, our permits are only for so long, if your construction project drags on for three years, four years, um, you need to uh, let me know. We have, we can renew your permit for that another year. Um, our permits are basically, I think, written for a two-year, one year. It's actually written for one year. So if you're doing a big subdivision, and that subdivision just keeps dragging on, you still need to let me know and renew your permit every year. You have to actually submit something to me in writing so we can extend your permit for another year. Um, there's no fees associated with re extending your permit unless something major changes. If you have a major change in your SWIFT plan that you've got to revise significant portions of it, then, then the, the initial fees are applied to it, which is, I think, 40 bucks. Yeah. Um, like I said, if nothing changes at all, we just will renew your, your permit again and we'll continue with what we've done with our office. So the renewal of your permit can only be renewed by the guy on the permittee. So again, your mom can't send me a letter. It's got to be the person that signed your, your permit has to sign the letter saying we want to extend, extend your permit. Um, if the permit does not successfully complete any work required on your permit, if we drive by and you guys just aren't keeping up with PMPs and uh, you, and I, we tell you, hey, you know your sill fence is down, and, and we drive by and you're required to have a backup within 24 hours, and we drive by again, your, your sill fence still is down, and we give you a notice of violation on that one, and we drive by and your sill fence is still down. At that point, then I will probably contact our uh, city employees, and they'll go out and do the work for you, and then we'll charge you. So um, it's probably a lot cheaper for you guys to do it yourself than for us to send out the city crews and set all of your BMPs back up. Um, the reason why we look at that very hardly is because we're um, bound by the MS4 permit. So not only can you guys get fined, the city of Casper can get fined. And so that is why we look at it pretty stringently. And obviously, if the city of Casper gets fined, we'll probably pass that along to you guys also. So it just ends up being a lot cheaper if you guys just plan on maintaining your own BMPs. Along with any of that, there could be other penalties associated with it. Um, obviously, we'd like to work with you as best we can, but we can't just let you just blow it off either. We were bound by a permit. There must four permits, so you guys are bound by that also. Um, your surety will does remain in place in full force for at least one year after the permit has been completed. Um, so once you're done and it's all seated and you got everything up and got all your BMPs in place and it's all cramped and looks great, we don't release that surety until at least one year afterwards. The only time you can get out from that surety quicker than that is that once you, you have to notify me at my office, we will meet you out on site and we'll inspect the whole entire area. Um, if we believe that it's seated back to the requirements, then at that point, then we can release your surety. Um, if you are just struggling and you don't do a good job seating, that surety can stay in place until it, until it gets seated back the way we want it. If it takes you three, four years to get it seated back to the coverage that we require, then it will hold that surety for that long. Um, we basically don't want you running away from this and, it, and causing any disturbance for any neighbors around you. Um, again, it's your guys' responsibility to contact me about when you think it's seated. Um, we're not driving around looking. I mean, we do drive around and look at it, but it's still your, your responsibility to notify me. So if you haven't notified me and we still have a hold of your surety, it's been a couple of years, I'm sorry, man. you got, you got to notify us. We, we're pretty busy, so we require you guys to notify us. And even if you're calling me every week and you're annoying me, we still need you to tell me so we can meet you out there and inspect it. Uh, all site plans should be shown in place until the fire submit and come over that. Um, if you're doing the, uh, if it's just a resident's house, if you're landscaping it, perfect. If you're doing a resident's house and you don't have any money to landscape it, we're basically still required to 
put up any BMPs necessary. So ultimately, there's no size requirements to the city of Casper. I mean, if, if you're building on a quarter acre lot and your whole lot has no grass, nothing on it, and it's completely dirt, even though you don't have a permit, we still inspect everything at the same level as this. You just don't have a permit in your hand. <coughs> Um, we're going to go over a lot of the other like enforcement rules on the next talk, but do you have any questions based on just the city's requirements for permits? I do. Yep. How does it work? Um, you know, just like the DEQ can transfer or uh, a builder can take a lot. How does that work with the city if, if a, um, a general has 30 acres in the subdivision and as they're selling lots, it gets further along? Are they still bound on their 30 acres in the city, or is there a way to reduce acreage if you go just like the DEQ? So um, we're pretty much kind of like DEQ. If you have 30 acres and you sell two lots and they start breaking ground on those two lots, then those two lots are bound by the homeowners or the builders. If they haven't transferred that over to the homeowner yet, then the builder is responsible for that lot. So then the major permit is only for the acres that aren't sold. Okay. Yeah. Um, update the permit as you do that. Or you have to at least notify us on what lots are sold because just yeah. because the lot's sold and nothing happens on it, we don't know that that's gotten sold. So if you've sold that lot and it's in now, whoever bought bought that lot back in the day, we don't know that. You have to come and tell us that you sold these lots and then that gets pulled out of your major permit. And then that goes to the responsibility of who owns the lot at that time. If they buy out an undisturbed lot, they're responsible for getting the seed. Is there bond reductions as that goes and you get halfway through or something like that? You've got half an acre now under your control? Once the surety is in place, we don't really reduce it. Okay. So you basically just need to finish off whatever we're doing. And if you sold all of your lots, then then we would look at some um, giving back your surety and stuff like that. Um, for instance, I have a subdivision that uh, I don't even know how big it is, but they sold two lots. And uh, those two lots dug the foundations. And you know, obviously those two lots got disturbed. But instead of just spreading the disturbed land right over their two lots, they decided to spread the spoils over the two lots next to them, which weren't sold. So now that the developer was stuck having to receive the two lots that the disturbed land got put over. And so I was not able to release the surety because, and he didn't even know that spoil got put over his, his lots that were sold. But once we went out and inspected it and saw that, you know, hey, all this, these two lots now are disturbed, I couldn't release that surety for the entire subdivision. He had to go receive those two lots again. But the two lots with the foundation in them, those are not in his responsibility. Uh, this is kind of the city's webpage we brought up. Um, we do have a new web page, and we have been updating it quite regularly in these last few months with Beth. She's been kind of helping spread and us do this. And everything we've talked about, the city of Casper, our codes, our stormwater permits, the BMP packet, our seating stuff, all that's on this Casper web page. Um, and we're, like I said, we're working on it now to update it. Um, there's the revegetation guideline that I'm talking about as far as how you how you need to have it vegetated back. And we'll kind of go into that a little bit in the next talk. Um, the permits on here also, it's basically under the building code part of our webpage. It's not under the engineering part. Because um, building code requires this for a site plan. So if you're building a Home Depot, that's a site plan. You need to go into the building code department and get a road control permit. Because Home Depot is usually bigger than one acre. So any site plan also is required to get uh, a road control permit from us. So it doesn't even have to be a subdivision. Site plans are, are enforced through our code enforcement department. Um, any big subdivision stuff like that is enforced through the engineering department. Same rules that build, that we have for these permits is the same rules the building and code enforcement. That's how they enforce the same thing. So there's no difference. Um, but you do have to be aware that just because it's not a subdivision, it's required to have one of these permits in your hand. So anything over an acre. Um, any other questions about our permitting process? Before we break for something else, I realized after Jason started speaking, that's not the finished version of my presentation. There are a few slides that are missing. Because uh, I didn't finish it until Tuesday. I was gone on Monday. So if, 
give you about five more minutes to be to finish up what I was going to say. I'm really dependent on like PowerPoint. If it's not staring me in the face what I'm supposed to say, it's it's not up here. All right. So how long do you need to have the state permit? You need to have the state permit until your site reaches final stabilization, which I will define in great detail in the transfers and termination part of the talk, or until a lot is sold with a completed home to a homeowner. Whether or not that lot is landscaped, unfortunately, the way the federal regulations are written, once it goes to the final homeowner, we're done with the house on it. That's once they move in, right? Once it's occupied? Once they have the certificate of occupancy. Yeah. So that that was the end of the construction. Did you have a question? What about in the commercial application if the owner takes over the building? Does that permit end there too? No. If it's a commercial application that you built a Taco John's or something, then if Taco John's is taking it over, it's not landscaped, then you transfer the permit right. to Taco John's. Okay. Thank you. And they babysit it until it's revegetated. All right, the MS4 permit, um, I was going to talk about that before you got started. We do have an MS4 permit. It's a stormwater permit on Casper storm sewer system, on the entire system, and what it discharges to all of the surface waters here in town. Um, Mills, Evansville, a little bit of Natrona County, and Casper College, and Wygott within the urbanized area are all permitted under this municipal separate storm sewer system permit. That's where the 4S comes from. Um, that's really not all that important. The important part of this is that this MS4 permit puts many requirements on the entities that are permitted under it. So Casper and all of the other entities in this area have to have their own construction stormwater program that looks very similar to ours. They can be more stringent than what ours are, but they can't be less stringent. So not only are we kind of running around town with stormwater permits, they're required to also do some of the things that Jason just talked to you about. Uh, <laughs> so along those lines, I mean, if you're working in Evansville, I mean, you still have to meet this stuff. The yes. Evansville is underneath the MS4 permit. So is YDOT. So if you're working anywhere within our area, I mean, the MS4 bounds us to make sure that you guys meet all of this. Otherwise, they can find us. Yeah. And so we don't want that. There's two questions for that. So do you have a boundary line for your permit? Is there a boundary? Yes. Yes. There is on the state's stormwater uh, webpage. Okay. If you go to DEQ wyoming.gov go to water quality by the way if you go to our new website and you're using internet explorer and you don't have like the latest version uh, 11 something you will get something that looks really weird and so make sure you've updated internet explorer if that's your browser of choice otherwise firefox and chrome seem to work fine but there is if you go to the stormwater page there's a municipal page and there are the maps of the Casper and Cheyenne urbanized area. Okay. The urbanized area is defined by the U.S. Bureau of Census, and so it's not on political boundaries. It's on a, there's a weird voodoo kind of mathematical description behind it. it my second question yeah. uh, is: so if, if there was, a, let's say, a stormwater permit or something in place prior to you guys getting the MS4? Are they grandfathered? Do they need to catch up to? We've had our MS4 for a while, so there's probably not a case where you're grandfathered in. We've had an MS4 under the city of Casper for seven, eight, eight, eight years. Eight, eight, seven, eight, nine years. Okay. With, it's just the EPA is now really starting to crack down, so DQ is really starting to crack down, so now the city of Casper is really starting to crack down. It's kind of that trickle effect. We find you, then the fine just keeps getting trickled down to the person that actually created the service. But, We've had that MS4 actually uh, for eight years. Um, we've, been re we've been required to send certain reports to DEQ for the last eight years as far as all of our practices and our inspections and our SWIP plans and stuff like that. You guys just didn't know about it until now. And so that's why we're having this conference. And, and both the cities of Casper and Cheyenne and the surrounding entities are relying largely on the state's requirement for erosion control. 
that sort of thing. They have some special stuff like the bonding and stuff that we don't have. So really, we're giving you the same message, which is why Casper invited us to come up and coordinate with them. And I also had contact information on our, one of our last slides and a fabulous picture of my dogs on the last one. <laughs> um, I'll make sure that um, Krista or Beth gets the final version. And so whenever she distributes it, you'll have it. So yeah. I apologize for that. We'll post it on our city web page and we'll give everyone an email that's signed up at the conference so they can go find these, these links and these, these presentations and applications and permits and all that. So we'll send that out by tomorrow or early next week. Um, any other questions? Good questions. Um, I know we haven't enforced a lot of these, but we're really starting to because we're starting to get a lot of pressure from everyone else. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. 